So what then, now that we understand what prejudice is, what is social identity theory? Well, social identity, it's worth saying, is one of the most important theories in psychology. It's certainly one of the most important in social psychology. It's produced a wealth of papers, a wealth of books, an incredible amount of research, and has been very, very useful in guiding what we're doing now. So what are the basic tenets of social identity theory? It starts off by saying that as well as an individual identity, we all have social identities and that these social identities are derived from our group memberships. So how do you think about social identities? You probably think of yourself as an individual. You have a name. Your name might be John or Jack or Mary, Salim, Lee, whatever it is, but you're also a member of certain groups. Are you a student? If you are a student, you probably think of yourself as part of the student group. If someone says something negative about students, you probably don't like it very much. If someone says something positive about students, you probably like that very much. Are you English? Do you think of yourself as English? If you're English, you probably like it when you see other English people doing well at the Olympic Games. You probably don't like it when you see English people being embarrassed at the Olympic Games. Are you an athlete? You probably like other athletes doing well and dislike other athletes doing poorly. And there are many different categories you can choose. You have language categories, age categories, race categories. Any kind of category you can think of can be more or less important to different people. But the important point is that we do think of ourselves in these categories. And they do matter to us, some more than others. And the last thing is that we strive to achieve positive group identity. And the motivation for this is our positive self-esteem. You like thinking well of yourself. You like thinking well of your own identity. And if part of your identity is your group-based or social identity, you like thinking well about that as well. So let's put that into a picture. That is a blue dot or a blue circle. This guy could think of himself as many different things. He could think of himself as a circle, as a two-dimensional object. He could think of himself as blue, like other blue dots. And over there is a green circle. And that person, of course, could also think of himself as green or as a circle. But we're going to choose green and blue now because we want to show the comparison between the green group and the blue group. Clearly, these actually represent identities that matter to people. These people could be of one religion and those people could be of another religion. These from one country and those from another country. But these are just the groups we're talking about so we can see it in abstract. So we have a blue and a green. If you have a social identity and you want to protect that social identity and you like to feel good about that social identity, you will respond in certain ways if you ever feel your social identity challenged. So if someone says, well, blue groups or blues are pretty bad people, you may respond to this in one of three ways. You could try to distance yourself from the blue group so you make yourself out to be less blue or relate yourself less to being blue. So for example, if the UK does really, really badly in a sporting event against France, for example, embarrasses itself miserably, you could say, well, that was the English team, but I'm Scottish and I don't have anything to do with them. You kind of separate yourself out from that identity. That's an easy way to do it. Another way to do that is to change your group allegiance. And this is especially useful when group boundaries are permeable. So let's say, hypothetically, someone says blues are very bad. A blue might then decide to stop being a blue and become a green. A good example of that is when people say, well, students are really lazy, and we taxpayers do all this work to support these very lazy students. Rather than distancing yourself simply from being a student, you could change group allegiance from student to taxpayer. You could get a job. You could stop going to university, go out, pay taxes, and then start complaining about how lazy all those students are. I'm not saying any of that's true, I'm just saying it's a strategy for dealing with that identity if there's a problem. So the other way you could manage it if someone were to say something negative about your identity, so about blues in this case, is to compare yourself favorably or treat other members of your group better than members of other groups. In this case, again, it's greens, but you could imagine there could be reds or yellows or anything else. But part of the way you make yourself feel better when your, your self-esteem and your group identity is challenged is by making sure that other groups look worse or that they get treated worse. And this own group preferential treatment is what we like to call prejudice. It equates back to what we were talking about before. And this is how we get prejudice out of social identity theory. Now that's all well and good to say, but is there any evidence that this is actually true? 
that this can actually be used to predict what people do in situations. And actually there's loads, and I'll only show you about three slides, and that's an embarrassing amount when you consider the wealth of papers and books and studies done on social identity theory. It's worth looking up, but I'm just going to show you three very quick things that help you understand that this isn't just something people have said, there is demonstrable evidence for it. One very good way of showing that social identity theory makes sense is by trying a minimal group paradigm. That shows us that prejudice exists in the absence of any real conflict. A minimal group paradigm is created when you have groups that don't actually exist. They're created groups. So if you imagine that I split your classroom in half for no apparent reason, and then I give some of you blue stickers and some of you green stickers, and I tell those of you with blue stickers that you are now blues, and the ones with green stickers that they are now greens. Psychologists have done this, or things very similar to this, and they find that almost immediately the blues begin to say things about other blues that are nice and things about greens that are negative, even though they didn't exist as groups before, and that they actually treat other blues better than they treat greens, even though this group did not exist five minutes ago before they put the stickers on. So that says there's something going on there that had nothing to do with any real conflict or any real resources. Other kinds of experiments that support social identity theory are those that show that people tend to maximize differences between groups rather than maximizing the actual group gain. So what this means is, if you give groups, let's say I create these groups, a blue and a green group, and I tell them that they can either give out rewards so that they get the most kind of reward, so let's say I'm giving out a certain amount of money, and you could either take 10 pounds for your group and give 9 pounds to the other group. Most people won't do that. They'd prefer to take eight pounds for their own group, for example, so long as the other group gets about two. So they're not going for maximum gain. They actually will take about two pounds less to make sure that the other group is more different from them than it would be otherwise. This shows that what we're doing isn't simply getting the best for ourselves or getting the best for our own group. We're actually trying to make sure there is a difference, a positive difference, between that group and our group. We're maximizing the difference, not the gain. And the third wave of support for social identity theory comes from a number of studies that show the predictable responses to challenge self-esteem, whether it's personal or group-based. That people do actually do these things. When the British team loses a sport, Scottish people do tend to pull away. When someone hears that this group is bad, they do try to change into another group. Or when they can't do that, they respond by trying to derogate another group or by trying to lift their own group up. Several studies do show that this actually happens and this lends a wealth of support to social identity theory. So social identity theory is very useful, but it's worth saying that it's not the ultimate theory of everything. There are still instances of prejudice that are not explained or explainable by social identity theory. One such example is conflict that's actually based on real-world resources. It's true that a lot of this might be emotional or based on how you feel and how you'd like to feel about your group. But it's worth pointing out that sometimes it's just about the land, or just about the money, or that there's a combination of factors, so that if you want money or land, or if you feel threatened, either ideologically, or actually physically, or financially, by another group, you may attack that group, or act in negative ways toward that group. And that's more explainable by things like real-world conflict theory than things like social identity theory. The other thing that social identity theory doesn't handle particularly well is a kind of positive-negative asymmetry in the differential group treatment. Now what does that mean? Again, if we go back to the experiment where we have the blues and the greens arbitrarily created, it's fairly easy to get blues to give other blues more good stuff than they would give greens. It's a bit harder, in experiments anyway, to get blues to dish out more negative things toward greens than they do to other blues. So they're willing to be more positive to their own group, but not really as willing to be more negative to the other group, if you can see the subtle difference. Why that difference exists in terms of punishments rather than rewards, that's a bit trickier. We're not really sure why that is, although there is still research being done about it. And lastly, there are a number of questions remaining concerning the social identity of lower status groups. There are some groups in society that are simply ranked higher than other groups. It is better, for example, to be rich than to be poor, at least in the society's view, in most people's view in society. But then that should mean that poor people should be adopting a number of strategies of really disliking the rich, or of derogating the rich, or of shifting out of it, or all sorts of things. But they don't actually always behave like this. In many ways, social identity theory predicts the behavior of higher status groups a bit better than the behavior of lower status groups. 
And we're not really sure why that is. Now, these aren't definitive. These aren't absolute shortcomings of social identity theory. And if any of these amazing people who've done the research could come in and talk to you today, they would have an hour-long debate about whether social identity theory even predicts any of that, whether or not that's a central tenet to social identity theory, whether or not this paper that they did in 2006 contradicts that paper that was done in 2004. These aren't the final answers. But it's just pointing out that some things do happen that are not explained by social identity theory, or that social identity theory can evolve or could grow, so that we could also figure out how to include all of these things in the theory. So, that was a presentation on how far does social identity theory explain prejudice. We can conclude that social identity theory gives us a good explanation of prejudice that goes beyond real-world resources. It allows us to predict interactions between groups based on their feelings and their self-esteem. And it doesn't explain everything, but it is essential to a good explanation of prejudice. And with that, I'm Dr. Keon West of the Institute of Psychological Sciences, University of Leeds. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good day.